no. Hey everybody out there, this is uh, Nick Wilbur, Fire Apparatus and Emergency Equipment. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Um, we are here live at uh, FDIC, uh, bringing back uh, Wynn Slough here to my right and uh, Alex Moody. Uh, first things first, uh, the studio is brought to you by Firehouse Subs and the Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation. Uh, enjoy, enjoy more subs, save more lives. Uh, find out more information about the restaurant ownership at www.firehousesubfranchising.com. Uh, so we're here, uh, we're back in uh, the studio to talk, uh, to talk rescue engines again. Um, this is kind of part two, and we're going to go over um, equipment this time. Um, and so uh, I'll let Wynn kind of start off with a recap of the apparatus um, and then we're going to go to uh, to Alex for the recap of uh, some of the different types of extrication we talked about. Um, and honestly, this one we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit more in the live aspect, and we're we're just gonna dive in and just start talking it. So, when if you want to take it away with uh, with talking about the apparatus? Yeah. So last time we uh, discussed identifying the function of the apparatus right off the bat, whether we want it to be primarily rescue or primarily engine company focused and that's going to dictate how we design this combination unit um, and and what we outfit it for um, based on the function that we designed right yeah. so we, we talked about if it's an engine rescue um, our prim primary function and our priority on designing is going to be engine company focused so more hose more yeah. um, water supply type uh, apparatus versus the rescue stuff and then if we decided hey we need this to be a rescue with capabilities and we're going to lose some of that engine company capability off of there and move more into the apparatus or the rescue tool function of it and how to to function as a rescue versus an engine and again that's we've talked about that and i think of every podcast where we just yeah. you know determine <laughs> determine function, 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 function of, the, of the apparatus before we um Put pen to paper really i mean that's really before we decide anything it's it's a function of the apparatus and then we can go from there on on how we're going to lay the rest of it out design it size and everything like that so real quick to jump in i think uh you know i said it today in my uh my presentation at uh, fdic here while i was teaching uh it's a famous tom shan quote and i'll say this till i'm blue in the face right any fire truck can fit on an eight and a half uh, by 11 sheet of paper doesn't mean it's going to fit in your first do or it's going to work for you or it's going to fit in your firehouse even if you're not measuring your firehouse before you buy it um so again i'll, I'll say that a hundred times but yeah you're 100 right. right and and you know to build on that the rescue engine that works for you know company xyz might not work for your company even though you're next door you might have different functions and again it's it's a, a conversation and, a, and um, discussion with them about what what they need you to do what you need to do and what you need for your general area and then work to combine that but again rescue engine on you know here and 10 miles away it might need an, to yeah. be an engine rescue so you know i think that's true is yeah moody you want to take it away let's go over uh, i guess the types of extrication like we kind of talked about in the last one so we can just dive into that more and and uh and what we're looking like uh, for the rescue style piece yeah so quick recap is we talked about three different types right from the Vehicle on all fours, that's the most basic stabilization. Vehicle not on all fours, side, roof, anything in between. That's a little more complex. And the thing that we won't spend a lot of time talking about is the heavy vehicle stuff, your commercial chassis, your trucks, buses, anything in that regard. If you are worried about that and you're trying to attack that hazard, then I think you need a heavy rescue. I think that's a different conversation. And, and, right? and what makes you say that? I know we kind of touched on it a little bit, but now here we are in the equipment section, right? What's yeah. what? we say heavy and is that the weight aspect or what, what what makes you say that yeah so if we're dealing with a passenger vehicle we're looking in that you know potentially three to five thousand range typically you could get up to ten thousand right depending on some heavier duty consumer level vehicles um but if you're with commercial vehicles they're potentially rolling down your highway at eighty thousand pounds that is not handled by two straws and a couple pieces of crate. it's not that realm um your education may not necessarily be more complicated, but if you're trying to lift, 
anything more than maybe an underride scenario where a passenger vehicle is underneath a tractor trailer, that we might be able to attack with a rescue engine, um, depending on the struts uh, or lifting capabilities you try to decide to include. Um, but you start, if that gets more catastrophic, that commercial vehicle is on its side or is on its roof, now we need way more struts. We need more compartment space than we probably have on a, a rescue engine, unless you really want to delve into the, the tandem axle rig for a rescue engine. And now we're, we're playing in a different territory, I think. Um, I think the other thing to add on to that too, uh, you know, coming from a, a more recent class that I took, you know, there's that lifting capability that starts really getting into there, right? You start working with underrides, overrides. Uh, you're not just stabilizing weight. You're now in charge of lifting that weight. I don't think you could talk heavy vehicle without talking lifting. And with lifting, we, you know, lift an inch, crib an inch, and that becomes cribbing and more struts and more capacity, depending on, you know, what, manufacturer of strut you look at there's just a lot more that comes with it and everything's chain and that's heavy and that's bulky and that's so yeah i think i think you're right and i mean you know we can go with the uh you know the the rescue style body with the the double deep doors on or double deep compartments on either side of the rig right but now we're still against that weight and capacity and hose bed goes and, up too and yeah. the other thing you know to, to build on that and again it goes back to um having those conversations early on is what do you want this rescue engine or engine rescue to be capable of doing? If, is it a car on it all fours? Is it a car on its side? Cause once you do get into um, lifting uh, stuff like that, you, you are going to start taking up more space and now we're going to transition away. So you have to have those serious conversations early on about what you want this thing to do because it will start to dictate. We have to start increasing our strut size to, to a larger strut versus you know, one that can handle a passenger vehicle or a small truck. And again, now we're starting to cut into the other aspects of what we want. And even if you're using the strut to lift, like he talked about lifting inch, crib an inch being the rule of thumb pretty much forever in vehicle rescue, you might have to start using struts to be that progress capture because to carry, you know, enough thing to capture a big lift with a strut, that's compartment space. And that's great, right. So we know that wood, takes up space, same with struts. Um, and with your compartmentation on that too, you know, I think we've had heard the debate recently of like struts take up less space, but they're capable of more than cribbing. Kind of, right? I don't know that that's not true, but also what you do to mount those in your apparatus is gonna change, right? So are you gonna have slide out trays? Spent a lot of time here at FDIC looking at mounting versions. They all take space up out of your compartment. So, and true, these struts are longer. So you're either going to go vertical or horizontal, depending on the compartment style you've chosen. That could affect your decision too. So I think that heavier style is going to demand just too much of your compartments when you're also trying to have engine functionality. Right. And I, I think Wayne can dive deeper into this, but you know, as the strut increases, you don't have that pass through compartment space like you do just on, thinking the same thing. Yeah, on, a, on a rescue yeah. squad. So yeah. I mean, really, you're Pretty limited. The only thing on the on it, and depending on the manufacturer, you might be able to do some sort of pass through in the rear compartment. Um, oh, down low, down yeah, low, yeah. depending after the after the tank, depending on how how big a tank you have and and what is is left over the axle, where you can do that pass through. But again, now we're talking about uh, it's back to taking up compartment space, and yeah. on a on a rescue engine, compartment space is at a premium, and, and that's and low compartment space. Right, compartment that's where the space, right? the heavy tools are going to go. You're not going to pull extrication tools yeah, from chest height and, up high, <laughs> and yeah. trying to come out of there. Right. So, um, and you know, then you have over the wheel well. That's another high compartment. So, so where do those tools go to take that back high compartment up? So, yeah, I think that's a huge consideration. There. Um, all right, so yeah, that's that's heavy vehicle. I think we kind of. Um, you know, there might be a capacity there, but your engine capability is going to be pretty much gone at that point. And I, and I should add, there is a way to plan for being useful on a heavy vehicle. You may not be able to solve that problem, but what you could do, and I, I've talked to some people recently about this, what you could do is stop the crush. Like that's the principle of progress capture. So if you are in an underwrite scenario and it's very heavy and it is crushing a vehicle with patients in it, you can plan to stop that from, from gravity from impacting your patients, right? So you can positively impact the scene. You simply may not be the end all be all solution right. to that scene. Um, so I just want to throw that in there. And I think with that too, staffing, right? You know, that's a, yeah. every conversation, right? And people think it's a volunteer thing. It, it's not, right? This is volunteer. We're 
uh, you know, conversation where you're making hard decisions on what's going out the road, you know, what's going down the road, how many pieces, one, two, three, um, you know, with a rescue engine or engine rescue, you might just have one rig going out the road. So you might have to talk to a neighboring department and neither one maybe has that heavy vehicle capability, but together you make a rig, you know, two rigs that show up with now eight people or six people together. And uh, now you can make something happen because showing up with three people ain't, ain't gonna happen. I mean, you know, it goes back to again one of the first podcasts we did. We can't solve staffing with a combination vehicle. Right. If you're trying to do that, you can see that that even though we're we're trying to combine a vehicle together, that that the staffing needs are still there, and you sure. can't fix. Oh, we have three people. We're going to do this. Well, you're still going to be screwed on people. So, yeah. and the component there too is training that staffing. Right? Yeah, um, right. So the right people. Yeah, make sure you have the right people on that rig when it goes out the door as well. Um, something your dad at his class talks about is you need to know who is actually showing up yeah. getting on the rig just because you have four bodies on there does not mean there were the four bodies you needed. Right. Know? Right. Um, Especially with heavy vehicle. Right? That's yeah. more into that. Let's, let's take a step back, I guess, back to just the, the regular passions of vehicle, right? We have, um, you know, a rig we're looking at and, you know, maybe we're going to go that engine rescue uh, route. Let's, uh, let's talk about what that engine capability can still be. Uh, I mean, I guess leveraging technology too. Um, uh, you know, I guess Moody hit on it first, and we'll jump in with uh, uh, with the apparatus side of things and maybe the engine side of things. But technology now, we're not looking at a rescue engine and it being quite as heavy. Like you say, struts are kind of more compact now and can save a little bit of room, maybe the same amount of weight. Uh, but uh, the really the extrication tools, right? We, you know, if we're going electric, like you had mentioned in the last podcast, that's that's changing the entire dynamic of reels, um, power, you know, generation out of the vehicle, right? With generators, uh, you know, we're kind of relieving a lot of that weight and maybe compartment space. Uh, do you think that that opens up an opportunity for an engine rescue to be? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that if door popping, I think that is easily accomplished, right? But we also talked in the last podcast, would you qualify that as a engine rescue or res rescue engine at all? Right. Or is that just an engine that has a spreader on it? Right. 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 Um, but the battery power tools, and I got plenty of playtime here this week to go touch all of them. There are options out there. Um, you can make it suit your needs to whatever you want. Um, and there's different weights, different styles, different batteries. Um, and something we've looked at too is with NFPI 1900, you do have to account for that battery charging aspect that's coming out. Yeah. Um, so that is something you need to look into uh, and pay attention to what your manufacturer is doing to account for that. Uh, but those tools are excellent in terms of less compartment space. I don't need hose reels. I don't need a pump, you know, and I think the trust is there too, right? Like I yeah. think that's a big one that people, and if you don't trust it, which I do understand if you're coming from a department that still only has hydraulic tools with hoses, you need to call some different manufacturers and get out there and test and evaluate these things and weigh them. Let your members put them up on their shoulders. Let your members cut things. See how fast or slow they cut things. How do they cut things? Like, do you like the way that feels when you use it? Do you get tired? Does the battery last long enough for you to feel comfortable right. carrying a certain amount of batteries? You know, and I think, you know, at home, my volunteer fire company, we basically are, are in the process of, of this change that we're talking about, right? We're going from a rescue engine to an engine rescue because of the change and, and the uh, modification of tools, I guess, the, uh, whatever, tools. It doesn't matter. But, but because we don't have to have the generators and all this stuff now, is we can, we're going to take, almost the same complement on a rescue engine and transform to an engine rescue, but still carry almost the same stuff. Yeah. The same stuff goes in, you know, we're, we're going to lose our airbag. But but if you look at technology and the way to change, there are different ways to lift now, right? Mm -hmm. And even some of it goes back to just a whole bottle jack, yeah. right? A bottle jack that's this big takes up a whole lot less space and an airbag and, and the, the control and all that stuff. So, so again, some of it's technology, some of it's different ways to, to even revert back to to, to older things, but but those techno technolo technological changes yes. are allowing us to downsize our rescue and again increase capabilities 
which is really what we need where I live at this point. I, I think with those struts, you know, you talk about lifting inch, cribbing inch, you know, everyone goes back to cribbing and airbags in that conversation. You know, the need for multiple airbags, need for, you know, the regulator, extra cylinders now for air, all the cribbing to kind of back that up. You take now two struts, one capable of lifting and one capable of capturing. You've done that in just this much tighter, easier, compact package. You've now done that, right? And maybe on that engine rescue, you can't lift it seven different ways. And we we play this game at work where, you know, especially when I first got assigned to the rescue squad, they'd be like, all right, lift that up. Okay, cool. Go get it cool and lift it up. Be like, all right, lift it up again, but that one doesn't work. <laughs> all right, lift it up again. That one doesn't work. And you just go down the options. But that's because we're on a heavy rescue vehicle. That's, that's our job. We should have 100 different ways to do it. But on that engine rescue, you need one, right? And again, that's where staffing and mutual aid comes in. Right. If, if that one way doesn't work, we got somebody coming right, you need help to, to yeah. help us out. Mm -hmm. So we have the option, we have the one. Um, but let's talk about the engine part, right? The engine rescue, let's, let's get into the engine part here. Yep. What are some considerations here? I know, uh, you know, first thing's probably tank size, right? Water, hose, what are, you know, what are the differences here from just our regular engine company? What's <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't, no, like, he doesn't want to talk. Yeah, he doesn't like engines um, out there. <laughs> no, so I think you know, tank size at the beginning, and I think it's something your dad brought up yesterday while we were walking around. Is that you know, I think 500 gallons. Obviously, for an engine company, that's the minimum we want anyway, right? Um, you don't want to be at a thousand, but it's somewhere 750. But again, the discussion that you have to have is how long. And, and again, what am I expecting this thing to do? If I'm building a rescue engine, maybe 500. Is where i want to be but if i'm building that engine rescue where i where again that primary function is engine and then, then i might want to have a little bit more water maybe work around that to some extent uh, again your your area is going to dictate that right if you're rural i mean we cover 90 plus square miles and in, in, you know where i volunteer at work if we we're going to build a rescue engine it would be completely different right. where you know you have not, fire trucks we're not building one of those no for well yes but you know you you could be at 500 gallons and be perfectly fine because you have everybody right up behind you. Um, again, you have to look at how long will what, my, whatever target flow that I pick, how long is that going to last and how how soon can I get that next engine? Right. What well, water's time, really. Water's I think time, you know, right? we've kind of talked water's about it before. I, I believe on the podcast, if not, you've been around me long enough. I've probably talked about it in other <laughs> aspects. Yeah, you know, water is definitely time. I mean, I'm not a huge water guy. I'm definitely ladder truck riding the rescue squad type of guy, which is interesting enough in itself but i think water is time and it, you know it's if if this is my backup engine right i have an engine as a primary this is my rescue vehicle but can serve as a backup engine or i'm using it for iso credit right i need a second pump or a third pump um in my iso credit because that's what they say we need uh well well then maybe you don't need all that water right this is my backup unit this right. is not my primary i need i need to be able to, to put water on this car fire until the, the true engine gets there. If we pull up and this accident is involved in fire, you know, what can I do to make a difference with that right away? But but if I pull up, if I'm running it first out and I pull up to that house on fire, I can at least get water in. I can maybe start a search. Um, and if we run out of water, we run out of water, but at least I can search started and we can maybe not get down, make a rescue if necessary um, and go from there. So the transition. a question I would have for you is if that's the case, we're talking kind of hose lines, how many hose lines do you think they should have, right? Because your first well, in engine, your next engine could be pulling a hose line off of that rig. Right. And again, I think, one. <laughs> I think that, that that's going to you know, change based on the function of the fire truck. Mm -hmm. If you want an engine, I think that an engine rescue, I think that there are, you can get four or five hand lines coming off that engine if you're willing to design it. Right? And yeah. it's based on, we, we, you're not going to do both things well. So yeah. you, can, you can pick one pretty well it's still not going to be as good as that engine company might be you might lose one now but again i can hand the day-to-day -day operations as the engine company basically now if i'm building a rescue engine I, I, you know i'm saying at least a minute or two one so i can get an initial line in and a backup line yeah and then provided i have some decent outlets on the engine everybody else hey bring your high-rise racks or you know your 200 foot off your engine and walk it up here and now we can add hose lines to it, right or we look at doing longer lay from the second do engine or whatever is necessary it does talking to your neighbors too it definitely means talking to your neighbors and having that understanding and having that layout of of you know and them understanding really what equipment you have so they know hey the rest of just for some team they have two lines off it already i need to put one with me but again you know you're you're trading something off there in order to accomplish that function 
So if I want high, you know, if I want full depth apartments on both sides, then my hose bed's going to get very narrow. Yes. And, I, and depending on the amount of supply line I need to carry, then that's going to dictate how much uh, hand lines I can get off the back. And maybe I'm just dealing with cross lays. Maybe I'm running two two bumper, you know, two bumper lines off the front, and that's where my two two hand lines are coming from, and giving me the rest of that apparatus for for that storage. Again, it's, it, it goes back to that functionality of what you want it to do, and then where you're responding to as well. Yeah, I think the cross lays come back in. You know, there's a you know coming from College Park, the big hand lines off the rear, you know, kind of thing. No cross lays, and you start talking rescue, you're not, you know, it's not really an option mm -hmm. anymore, especially that through. Uh, double depth compartments on either side you know that's that's definitely going to change things I, I think also too you know this this goes towards the, the rescue engine conversation you know maybe engine rescue and honestly we can even dabble into just the, the rural engine conversation of what special service equipment we're going to carry and you know that dives deeper past just extrication but uh we talk about now forcible entry equipment we talk about that firefighting, you know, ventilation saws, whether we're doing paint saw or circular saw, um, you know, PPV fans, right? Are we responsible for, for ventilation? Um, you know, talking to uh, to Tom Shan, right, about the, the Navy spec that he used to be a part of there before he kind of retired recently. Uh, you know, you got some of those units that will have ladder trucks with it, and, you know, they're kind of set up like a rescue engine. They're not carrying any tools, uh, you know, for extrication. Uh, but the equipment they need to carry, right? They are a special service to the area. They got to carry it kind of all. Um, so, uh, you know, what what types of equipment are we looking at for that? And, uh, you know, where are we going to fit it? And, and what does that look like? Um, I mean, so the first question that you can talk to that's not vehicle extrication, but where we work on a strip mall, right? And a lot of places have strip malls. I don't really know too many places in America that don't have some form of that. We're going to side Charlie or side three. We're going to the back. Um, that means I'm always taking a rotary with me to gain access to that side of the building. And depending, we talked about this in the last one, you know, if in your first due, you're an engine, and your second and third dues, you're a rescue, depending on how dispatch goes, a lot of variability to that. You may need to have that. They might be counting on you for that access to the backside of a commercial structure. Um, if you don't have that, who does? You know, and maybe there is a rescue that can handle that for those types of things. And I think that's good. I think that that opens up a question that we haven't really touched on. We have focused primarily on vehicle rescue. It almost seems like, um, and, and we haven't focused really on, on the aspects that, that at some point you are going to have to carry that extra stuff. And, and again, it, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it goes back to the, that, <laughs> it goes back to the function. function. <laughs> and what you and what yeah. you and what your neighboring fire companies yeah. expect for it to be, if you call it a rescue engine, because, you know, you have, standards in your your area and you call it a rescue engine and hey rescue engine you know 21's responding and the incident commander says hey rescue engine 21 i need you to to you know take your saw to the rear and start cutting gates off well uh we, we you know we're we're really an engine company we so right, like you have off others and spreaders right, like, that's that's not really off the saws it. on start trying <laughs> yeah, to work on yeah. a bunch of four or five but, doors yeah, but it is good and, and we've we've <laughs> captured the been you know, primarily focus on on the vehicle aspect of things. But you're right; you have to have those stalls, and you have to. But again, that's where you know, get my my rest, current rescue engine has all those capabilities. It's set up to act as almost all three. It's got extra ground ladders on it. It has the saws on it. It has all the extrication equipment on it. What it doesn't have is a whole lot of great hand lines or pump capabilities, right? It has a small on it, um, but it, it will function. It has five hundred of water. We can do it, but we have those capabilities as well. So, but again, you're into that two different types of engine rescue versus rescue. Yeah, and looking at all of the different mounting options that are available, so let's take up a lot of space. Yeah, and that's the thing. On this new one, I'm we are going to lose a capability to do that yes. because we just again you got to pick and choose on it. You can't do it all. I think one of the designs that I saw that um, actually Prince William, where you're from, that's kind of the standard engine option. We saw those pictures. Um, we're kind of floating around is that uh, the normal, I guess, engine setup with the low uh, ladder on the, you know, on the passenger side, the officer side, mm -hmm. right, with the standby racks, you know, uh, pretty low setup, normal looking engine, if you will. And then on the other side, it's, it's not a rescue engine for that capacity to carry some of those extra tools that has that rescue style, uh, you know, depth on the compartment on the driver's side. 
Um, and you know that could be something too where uh, you can explore just trying to keep some of those tools and things on the lower end on, on the firefighting side and maybe have some of those options on the other side. And that, that goes back to a rescue engine too, right? Um, or, or an engine rescue, I guess, more specifically. You know, we have that, that extra height and maybe extra depth to carry some saws, some fans, and some struts, but we're not necessarily diving in and taking away too much of the engine stuff. We're kind of more than there. Right? And so I think, the, you know, actually, again, you, you look back at technology now, right? Now there's battery operated rotary saws that are about this big. Yeah. So now we just bought space and yeah, weight and weight <laughs> back yeah. into where, again, we can now begin to increase some of those capabilities that we might have lost at one point. More batteries to charge. It's more batteries, yeah, more batteries yeah. <laughs> but you don't have to charge them all. No, time. no, you know, they <laughs> but, pretty well. But again, these, these, so again, you, where I was just talking, Hey, we lost that capability. Maybe we did. Maybe we just, as we're, we get farther into this, thing, we can, we can add this thing, right? Because then it builds into and all those other kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Now, are, you know, is it as powerful as a big battery gas powered saw? No, of course not. No, but can it get you through a door? Right. <laughs> right. Can it get us started? Yeah. Well, or again, you talk about power. Are you trying to be a rescue squad or you were you a rescue engine? Right. right. That's the other thing. Right. I think that'd be out to that too. And again, it's sizing again, back to again, sizing up your first view, right? Do you have a lot of gates on on you know, on windows, right? Do you have a lot of bars on windows? Do you have a lot of you know heavily fortified locks? Like in Arlington, if they're heavily fortified, there's probably uh, armed guards on the other side. Like it's a federal building and we probably don't right. want to cut that down anyway. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna be me that's going in there. Um, you know, but if you go into you know other areas, there might be more in the way of fortification or locks or commercial strips or something like that. You know, we're just not running into that point as much, um, especially outside those, you know, strip shopping centers. Um, but again, we have a vehicle dedicated for that. So um, that's kind of how we handle handle that type of thing. Um, yeah, so fans, ventilation, right? That's that's another one that, you know, we've, we've come a long way from those big uh, uh, negative pressure, box fan, exhaust fan, heavy, taking up a lot of area. I mean, there's some pretty compact options out there now for, for ventilation, too. And it goes back to, obviously, power to, to charge them if they're battery powered. And, um, you know, again, even fuel storage, I think, is a weird one, right? We take away, uh, you know, we put batteries on there. You take away all the fuel cans. You think you had to carry right you uh you have a saw you had if you have fuel for 40 to 1 and you had straight gasoline for the generator then you had straight gasoline for the portable um, the extrication generator right then then you had one saw that went in there that was 50 to 1 now it's another fuel can right i mean so just going battery i think you open up space from that too. Right. i mean it's, it's it's pretty crazy um so i think there's a lot of options with that um last podcast you had mentioned too about specialty right making that change to uh, you know, an engine rescue or rescue engine for, uh, you know, water rescue or some sort of other specialty maybe coming into that aspect. I mean, um, talk more about that. Let's <laughs> dive into it. Let's go. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that is a, a tough one because you're effectively adding a third uh, or fourth, mission or fourth <laughs> or fifth some, sometimes job to this vehicle that not putting it down in a disparaging way, but it kind of is identity crisis already so now we're going to add another one (laughs) that it needs to manage right um and if you do get called as a rescue that kind of the vehicle thing well if it's somebody down an embankment you may need rope or something if that's how you get dispatched and there's woods on the side of many roads in america so you may need something that's going to allow you to do a low angle thing i'm talking high speed high angle stuff but like a low angle operation maybe in your realm or if you're on a highway, you need to take into account that you might be running a hazmat incident on the highway. So now you have to maybe bring those concerns in, like how much you know, kitty litter, clay absorbent do you want to use to help clean up spills or mitigate large gasoline spills and what have you, any other fluids. Um, but that could delve deep farther into a specialty conversation of do you have hazmat capability in your area? Everywhere's kind of different in terms of response right. requirements for that specifically. Um, and then water rescue, that's a that's a complete different thing. I don't know that you want people overloading their axles with a boat, perhaps, on the roof. That's probably not a good idea all the time. Yeah, uh, definitely <laughs> want to watch for that. But again, at water rescue, as as things change, you know, we see flooding as a more. So, you you know, you think yeah. of water rescue as some big, you know, stream or uh, creek or uh, river that you're going through to rec- rescue this stuff. I mean, it could be anything. It could just be high water in a yeah. place one day where now you have to put your vests on and you have to throw, you know, have throw bags, bags and things like that. Sure. Um, 
I know so, we carried that in College Park on the engine, and we had nothing to do with water rescue, but we had multiple events where we just had high water, and we were just starting to be prone for flooding, whether it was, uh, you know, the drainage system not keeping up, the rain getting heavier, the buildings, there's less grass. What You know, I'm not a scientist and can go deep into any of that explanation of why, but it's happening, and well, now here we are running this call type we didn't run before. We're not a water rescue team, but who would we be not to – Equip our members with safety things to, to go out there and be able to at least start or handle or make a rescue, you know. Like, and that is something to pay attention to. You're starting to run into these communities personally that are building up exponentially really, really fast because of yeah. industry and, and incoming businesses and stuff. They're going to have to deal with that. And that could be something they're not even thinking about yet. That's a really good point. I mean, that's coming. And, and I, I think, you know, if we to, to talk about specking and building stuff out is – depending on what you do decide to do is you can get creative with some of this stuff, right? There are yeah. lots of void spaces in these fire trucks mm -hmm. where you can put the, the, you know, off due stuff um, where, you know, you can put your water rescue stuff somewhere. If you're talking that low angle stuff, you can get it up high, but, but as you're looking at your blueprint or you're designing your fire truck, you need to look at those void spaces, right? If I do um, full depth and high side compartments on both sides or they're at some point above, you know, maybe seven feet up, they're just void spaces. But if yes. you don't decide what to do with it, whether it's a coffin compartment, a sliding compartment of some sort, um, you know, you're going to lose that space. So you can look at that apparatus, look at what's available, and then work with the manufacturer to to use up that, util you know, that usable space. Again, mm -hmm. factoring in the weight as you're designing it. And I think that's, that's going to do. That's a huge one, too, when you're talking specifically rescue engine. Um, you know, talking to some departments, talking to some people, um, talking to manufacturers out here at FDIC, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, options for, you know, quick deliveries, uh, stock units, things like that. Uh, definitely an option, right? Definitely something to look at on the engine rescue side. I think that's fine. Um, but you see some of these larger tank capacity rescue engines being kind of put out there. And that's really what I think you need to look at is, is weight. Um, when we start talking about water rescue, uh, you know, we really haven't hit EMS at all, right? That's a huge part, you know, carrying EMS equipment and being able, you know, whether it's back or, or some sort of other response outside of maybe even being a you know paramedic capable with, you know, ALS drugs. Um, you have, you know, ballistic protection now. That's, a, that's an honest conversation to wait. And a lot of that stuff now is going towards that front axle, right? Yeah. Um, you know, people are throwing raised roofs on those, those uh, types of vehicles with a thousand gallon water tank. That, you know, you're really coming in close to that front axle rating and, you know, ballistic protection weighs something, you know, PFDs weigh something. Stokes basket. Stokes basket, right, weighs something. Now the cross lays have to be up there because that's the only place the hose can go. We start adding all that stuff and that's that closer part to that front axle. Um, you know, now two bumper lines, right? We're, we just keep tabbing up that, that front axle weight. Um, and if we go into a stock unit, we really have to be careful because we weren't, this wasn't us designing this. We're not using right. all those nooks and crannies like we were. Um, and maybe they're not available now because that stock unit doesn't have it. Maybe it is. Maybe that's the perfect thing. But that's, again, goes back to that mission. The other thing we're getting, you know, somewhat a little bit off topic with the rescue engine, but not really. But if you're buying a stock unit, who's paying attention to the axle? Weights? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what, what weight was that axle based on? You know, what, right. what equipment weight was that based on? You buy you buy an off the shelf or a demo unit, and you don't pay attention to that. Well, you know, in in two years, they call you guys to come do a you know to do a fleet, fleet evaluation, <laughs> and you're like, hey, this thing's way overweight, and you guys can't use it anymore. And right. that's so you know, it is good to, to talk about that. To say, hey, we're we're getting ready to buy this demo unit, but you need to think all the way through it and and talk with your vendor about what you really want to carry on it. Make sure you have those weights because again, that's a, that's going to fall back on you. That's not the vendor at that point. And if you're not doing the stock thing, you need to make all those decisions ahead of time. So they build it, hold it. Great. Right. right. Like you don't want to, you certainly want to be on the other end of the other end of that conversation where you picked all of these things that you want to be capable of and now you can't hold it. I, I think just to review, you know, the NFPA standard, NFPA 1900, right? They have that, uh, you know, calculation of weight or the tabulation of, of weight. That's that's your your minimum standard. And you know, if you've listened to any of the other podcasts that we've had on any of the uh, the NFPA standards, um, you know, it's, it's pretty clear, uh, uh, you know, that that's a minimum standard. Yes. And so we look at 2,500 pounds for the rescue engine 
type vehicle, that cubic footage of the compartment or 2000, if you have less, right? Um, that, that's the weight they're basing it off of. Can you carry 4,000 pounds? Absolutely. You just got to tell them that, right? And on a stock unit, they're not listening to that. Could there be 4,000 pounds available? Sure. If the stock unit was built and that's just the axling, the way it worked out, but that's something that you got to ask, you got to know to ask. And then, go ahead, sorry. Well, again, too, going on the weight thing is, depending on the manufacturer, the weight of, the, of what you plan to carry in a compartment could change. So, again, you need to carry that. Is it a 500-pound Load is a eight eight hundred pound. Yeah. What we talked about the rescues the other day are fourteen. I think yes. is what we saw. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, what is the weight load of that floor capacity? And then the same thing. What what Shelf. are the shelves <laughs> capable of carrying? You, so you know, again, it, it, you can run into trouble if you don't really, especially building a rescue engine and side to side too. Yeah, right. There was a presentation today too of, of someone last name Wilbur that wasn't me. Uh, he talked about where as well, where that weight's gonna be put, yes. right? Forward the axle or back. We talked about there being all that space behind the rear set of uh, tandems there. Well, that's great, but if you put all your weight back there, you're offloading the front. You're gonna go over overweight and underweight on the front very quickly. Yes. Um, and, and it goes back to the OEM, right? Whoever you buy the fire truck from, there are minimum standards for that front axle. Um, there's not a minimum front to back rate, weight ratio but if you're outside of that 80-20 and you have less than 20% weight on the front, no OEM out there is going to say, yeah, we're okay with that, right? When you're starting to make the left-hand turn and it's a little snowy outside yeah. and she ain't turning left, yep. that's a problem, right? Yes. And so <laughs> not just what you're putting, the capacity of the compartment, the capacity of the axle. When we talk about capacity of the axle, it's the axle, the springs, the suspension, um, the tires, right, the rims all that stuff so you can get your tires changed they put a tire different tire on there that could actually change everything too right? so we have to look at all that stuff right the braking capacity we get into these uh f-550s and smaller vehicles it's not the axles that limits it it's the it's the gross vehicle weight rating it's it's limited by the brakes um so looking deeply into that the compartment and now we're looking at where it's at right the balance of it all um and it just goes back to nfba 1900 and 1910 now where you're weighing your apparatus when you get it before you pay for it way before you pay and then weighing it annually because mm -hmm. everything changes right mm -hmm. we just saw all great stuff out here on the floor at fdic of just all the new stuff that's coming out um all the different technologies well that's going to change how you outfit your your vehicle you go out here and spend a couple thousand dollars come back to the firehouse change a whole bunch of stuff out that just changed your vehicle right? And that could be good or bad, right? Lessen it up and make it easier, or you just shifted weight and now it's not good. And I give credit to all those manufacturers everywhere that I was putting hands on things and picking up pamphlets. They all had weights. Yeah. Every single tool. It's there. They told me what <laughs> weight it was. It's not a secret. They want you to weigh it. Yeah. <laughs> they want you to know that information. Um, so I, I think just compartment space wise, too, you know, defining that, you know, the function again, we're going to hit it one more time. Um, you know, when you look at the equipment you put on the bay floor, you brought it up last time, right? Chopping out those lines of what that compartment looks like. You know, wind brought up bringing out and spending a couple hundred bucks on wood and just building the compartment out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe start with the bigger ones and working smaller so you don't have to buy yeah, quite right, as much right. money. <laughs> but, 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 you know, making sure those compartments are kind of laid out there. We'll set those compartments up. Well, now guess what? We, we can figure out what we're going to carry and we can see if it's going to be an engine rescue or rescue engine. We talked about the compartments being useful, but if we're carrying hard sleeves because we're in a rural area, that there goes your, you know, if that's where you're going to store them, there goes your, right. your coffee you're compartments, some space right? There. So it, it's that uh, maybe you put them on the roof now, right? Instead, and but now that's the raised roof you're on. And that's but that again, space. You know, again, we're, we, uh, you know, just talking about what I'm doing at home is we took that full depth on the one side. We were still able to put a hard tube up there, but because that full depth pushed over and you lose basically what will be your hose bed. That that opened up space mm -hmm. above us to either do a, a full depth or some depth of a slide in where we could put, you know, a longer piece of cribbing or mm -hmm. struts, or uh, we ended up not closing that off on the back and then doing coffin compartments up on the top. So again, that space is there sometimes. It's just you need to do your research and look around. What's right. available? What can I do to maximize the space on this engine, depending on the body size I have, right? Mm -hmm. Can we put like college park did? And we put hard tubes on the on the roof of the cab. Right. You know, again, yeah. it's not something you guys probably don't use it that often. So why take the body space? With them? But yeah. do you need them? Right. Or you did at that point technically to be an FDA compliant. Now you don't even need them. 
But say you do need them, you know, that's not a bad spot to put them. Now, again, your length of tube is going to shorten based on that, right? You might not be able to have a 14 inch, 14 foot tube. You might be down to, you know, to 10 to where you have to carry more of them. But but again, look at different options for storing that stuff. I I think it goes back to, again, how small the fire service is. We're not this gigantic fire service like everyone thinks. There's a lot of good ideas. We get to see a lot of them. That's why we're here talking in front of you. Um, and and we're, we're glad that we can share them, right? And, and kind of different ideas and, and spitball. Um, but every time we go somewhere, we see something new. So, so reach out, talk to the people that have done it, that have recently done it, that did it 10 years ago, and how they like it now, right? What's changed and what's working, what's not working. Yeah, what's uh, not working. The, 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 <laughs> what doesn't work? The, the last thing I want to see is, you know, and I, and I went through this spec in a ladder truck at College Park. We sat down. It's like, all right, we're going to do this, 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 this. And you're like, we need to start from the beginning. Are we doing a, a truck or a tower? And they're like, looking at me like I'm crazy. And it's like, well, we've always had a truck. You're right. We have. <laughs> but has that changed? Yeah. Right. And the conversation was quick, right? We're surrounded by tiller trucks. We only have, okay, well, that's, we, we still have to talk about that. It's not, this is what we had. This is the start. We need to look at the area, do a needs assessment of everything. Do we need more? And you talked about having more ladders on your, on your engine rescue, your rescue engine. You know, that's great. Like, is that still a need? Maybe it's right. an engine rescue that just has more ladders, right? You take away some of that rescue or special service capability, but really the ladders are still there as a need. And, and you know, that's that's an awesome conversation to kind of have. Um, you know, we're coming up here, I think, on, on the end of the time we have. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's just go over the last parting thoughts, I think. Moody, you want to start us off and take us home? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just be deliberate in those decisions. Right. Like, I think we've really hit a lot of the equipment between the last uh, episode, which is on fire apparatus and equipment podcast. Um, you can find that there if you need to, um, to reference that. But we hit that, those equipment choices. Determine your mission, function, 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 as you guys have stated many times. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's really the key is make sure that you're making choices consciously and not flying by the seat of your pants. Um, otherwise. I really think that this is this is a good source to start from and get together with the committee and make decisions. Yep. I think Alex said it well. I'll just keep going, um, stealing, you know, um, other people's lines. And I actually forget which one you say all the time. So now I can't do it. <laughs> I'm so glad always. you can't see my line. I'm so happy now. I'm it's, happy this happened to you. Yeah. It's, always, <laughs> always it's always me. It's always me. That's always you. why we put you in the middle. Yeah, no, why we put you in the middle. Alex said it all. Function, function. <laughs> <laughs> If I can, if I can, like your line before you get it out, I will. If it comes back, I might not even say it. I'm just not gonna say it. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot of information here. Um, please, you know, reach out. Uh, you know, company, you have it. Hold on. If you don't know, don't be afraid to ask for help. <laughs> See, there you go. That's yeah, it. I, so I got it. Came back. I, I looked right into the camera. That so was good. <laughs> yeah. He did steal it. Um, <laughs> that was fair and square. I like that. All right. So, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think wrapping this up, uh, you know, the company that uh, that we all kind of work for behind the, the scenes of fire apparatus and equipment um, is emergency vehicle response. Right. Um, you know, check us out. Look us up. You know, search emergency vehicle response dot com. Fill in a contact form. Reach out to us if you want, um, you know, and, and if you want help. And again, just conversations. We love talking fire trucks. That's why we're yep. here. Yeah. It has nothing to do with anything else. So reach out with any questions. A lot, you know. We're, we're absolutely heartbroken. We go into to fire uh, houses and stuff and into departments and they got taken advantage of or didn't know or didn't understand. And they're in an overweight condition. That's that, that breaks our hearts when we do that. And it's it's not safe. Right. And, and that's the last thing we want. So um, reach out for us you know, to, to help. And, you know, some of it obviously we charge for. But a question is, is always free. So please just just ask the question. Don't don't just hold it in and, and don't think you have a place to ask. Um, for this podcast, other podcasts that we've done, and the part one for this one specifically, uh, Alex mentioned it, uh, fire apparatus and equipment. Um, and, you know, go back there, uh, check them out. Uh, we have a couple podcasts that we've done, uh, me and Wynn and, and Alex uh, before. Um, search the rescue engine part one. Again, this is part two. Listen to them both, digest the information, reach out with questions. Um, and again, this is uh, live from uh, FDIC, first live show for us. And uh, appreciate you guys listening in. Have a great uh, rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs>